Thank you, Matt. Um, it is a great pleasure. I have sort of invited myself. Um, <laughs> uh, Matt and I, as Matt said, have been um, collaborating um, increasingly over the last 10 years. I met him when he was a, a grad student, and um, he's been in on the story of web science from the beginning. And uh, I happened to be in New York at, um, for a series of meetings, as Matt said, and I I wanted to get together and he said he'd come into town and I said well I've never been to Rutgers so here I am and it's fantastic to talk to you because it's just and I'm you know there's several things like meeting people for lunch because I'm very keen to um, involve the people here through Matt in the work that we're doing um, so just to um, I'll whiz through because you guys will be very familiar with this and I hope we have time for discussion we're supposed to finish around well, oh, okay, so we've got a bit of time. Good, okay. Um, so, forgive me if I don't. Do you mind if I sit like this? Is it, I've had it, I've arrived on Thursday last week uh, and lost my voice, and I've had a horrible cold ever since. So I must have picked it up in the UK because I lost my voice on the plane. And um, so I'm a bit um, struggling with my voice, and uh, I might have a coughing fit. And um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I've also got a dodgy knee, so it's lovely to sit down and just relax and, and talk to you, talk you through what we're doing. So, um, uh, of course, my story starts with uh, the um, two big inventions, but I could go back a lot further. I started my work in this area in hypertext. So uh, when I was um, doing my formative work in hypertext, the internet was beginning to emerge. And I remember doing email in the 80s. Um, <laughs> that was my first sort of knowledge that this, uh, since then it's been my privilege to meet Vin and Bob, and um, I even share a platform with them. And uh, when you're young researchers and you have these people that you look up to, and then suddenly you find yourself talking with them on the set, and it's just quite awe-inspiring. Anyway. Um, and I was doing around uh, in the 80s, um, I was a mathematician originally, but I got very interested in um, computers when the personal computers came out, and I started doing work with multimedia and hypermedia, and I uh, met Tim. So this is Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, and I first met him at a conference in Paris, uh, the first European hypertext conference in 19, Christmas 1990. We were developing a hypermedia system called Microcosm at the time, which was far superior to the web in many ways, but it was not the things that Tim pushed on so hard. The open, we were, we had proprietary code, and um, hit. So Tim's real legacy to the world was uh, the openness, the, sp the spirit building on the internet of the protocols that he developed, being open and free, uh, sorry, open and scalable, and, and he gave it away. That was his real legacy. And in fact, also, I, I found out recently that CERN, he was working at CERN in, I'm sure you know this story, in December in 1990 when he wrote this proposal here. It's called Information Management, a proposal. He, he wrote it in 1989. He hadn't called it the World Wide Web then. And his boss, Mike Sendel at CERN, um, wrote on the top here, vague but exciting. <laughs> and that gave Tim permission to develop these ideas as part of his day job. And in this proposal, if you look at it on the web, you can see it now on the web, of course, the whole of the essence of what he was trying to develop, which is much bigger than people think. People think it was just it's just HTTP and HTML. The vision was and is much, much grander than that. It's about a global information system supported with this concept of hypertext. And um, uh, it always had, the vision always included linking data as well as documents. And in the bottom right hand corner there is the embryonic semantic web, or the web of linked data that many people think he grafted on later. It was all part of the original vision in the fact that machines can interpret data in ways we can't, and that's what we're learning to live with and understand today. But he had to regress back to a web of documents because that's about what people could understand. Um, and just before I leave this slide, that the key thing that I learned this 
year talking to the people at CERN is CERN almost start they started to charge for it. They were gonna a bit like you remember Gopher and because uh, that was quite dominant at the time and I think it was Minnesota, I think it was was Gopher. Anyway, they were beginning to charge for Gopher. And um, CERN were going to charge a license for what, became, what Tim and Robert called the World Wide Web. And then Tim persuaded them this was not the way to go. Economic barriers would stop people using the system. And his hypothesis was either everyone would use it or nobody will. And that's what we've, we've done. That's what he's done. Um, so this graph, which uh, um, is now an ex-PhD student of mine, because he's got his PhD, Mark Schuler, keeps up to date for me. It's a very simple graph, really, but it's also very illustrative of the journey we've been on in the last 25 years and you know starting with the one website that Tim put up at, in December 1990 um, and then they called it the World Wide Web and I remember thinking how pretentious to call it the World Wide Web it's like the World Series of Baseball which when you're outside of the US you think well okay only US people only the US and Japan play baseball so how can you call it the World Series anyway that's not story, you know. but it was the World Wide Web you know I was working on this wonderful system called Microsoft which I thought was going to take over the world and there were several other people with competing systems and um, but his concept was it was for everybody and he tweeted that in the Olympic Games in London in 2012 he tweeted this is for everyone and he meant this is for everyone and that is his true legacy and I will say now, we are looking at that legacy disappearing at the moment. You know, there's a lot of challenges, and maybe that's the right thing, but, but there's a, the web is changing, or the, the, the ecosystem in which it's in, it is, is, is changing, of course, and that's part of this story. Well, that is this story. So, um, so many things to talk about. I can talk about this slide forever, but things like um, the, the real lift for the web, uh, initially was the mosaic work um, which gave the web an easy uh, front end. Um, Tim's first um, browser know, interface was an editor as well as a browser and was exceedingly complicated to use. Um, it was really quite hard to see the vision because it was all about learning to use the editor um, and what, of course, Andreasen and Co. did was said, actually, we just need to be able to look at this stuff. Just let's, let's have something that lets you type in a URL or whatever, click on a link and go. And, uh, you know, you've got the, the, the browser, of course, wars with uh, Bill Gates becoming involved and uh, the Microsoft for a long while was the way everyone got onto the web. And then you've got the dot-com boom and bust and things like... Um, in retrospect, you see that that dot-com bubble, people piled in because they, everyone wanted, they, all the investors wanted to be Bill Gates, make a lot of money. They didn't get this idea that actually money was going to be really hard to make in this model because the business model that Tim um, gave us with the way he pushed for the web to be open and free was he, the business model on the web is you have to give it all the way to start with and then work out how to make money. And that is the dominant business model that as people have had to come to grips with and are still working with. Um, and there are many different ways we could have achieved this. If you look back over the hypertext research, there are lots of different proposals for how you would do this. And I think of this like, um, if you've read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Douglas Adams, this is we're actually all an experiment run by the white mice. <laughs> and this is the white this is the hypertext the white mice have given us, if you like. And there could there could be other ways to and I often also say, I'll say it now so don't forget, um, is that if we kill this way of doing it, for what you know, for the various reasons that are becoming apparent, like the growth of the Facebook silos or uh, cyber security issue, people stop using it or whatever. Um, I think we know enough now to think there would be a real web movement growing alongside. And in fact, there always has been, ever since Bill Gates got involved, there's always been the Mozilla of this world, Mozilla, Mozilla's of this world that have, have kept, protected the open approach. They are, of course, under, Trump, under, under pressure at the moment. And it's all about how do you protect this in the face of all the pressures. 
that are now on this world because it has become so dominant. It is the way the world runs, and so naturally the pressures are huge. And there are pressures between states, there are pressures between companies, there are pressures in terms of our freedoms and privacies. They are huge pressures that are um, we have to resolve in order to um, take this system forward. And, and we may fail to do that because this has been such a short space of time. 25 years is nothing. It's a blink of less than a blink of an eye in terms of how long we've been commun we've been communicating between human beings in this world. The millennia we've been doing that. This is nothing, and we may have got it wrong. We may have to start again. And there are all these sorts of um, very interesting philosophical issues around. But just to taking again um, the dot com bubble bursting, it had to because. If you look at the, Mark has just put on here the technology sort of drivers, and from a very, and this is from a very Western viewpoint. I've been um, supervising a student recently who's been doing these graphs from different viewpoints of different political cultures, like China, like Korea, like um, we haven't done India yet, but all the, you know, I mean, this is a very Western view of the of the internet, although it is the total number of users. Um, so it's quite confused in the literature about this. But anyway, the point is that the Wi-Fi and broadband don't emerge until uh, the middle, uh, the, middle the, the turn of the century. So in, when people were trying the initial shopping retail sites, work was so slow. We used to call it the World Wide Wait, because you'd wait you know, for an image to appear, and then it would crash, and you'd have the modem at home, and it was just, nobody had computers at home. They were too expensive, there was nothing to do with them. Most people didn't have computers, so that bubble had to burst, and there was, there was nowhere for this, these hugely inflated companies to go. And some of them stood the test of time, like the Amazons. And, and Google, another amazing part of this story, you all know that story of Bryn and Page, and the, uh, the uh, page rank algorithm and the starting of the company Google. Google doesn't emerge as a force that most people would know about until about 1999. You know, 10 years after the first website went up. And this is a really important point in this world because it's um, unlike computer science that I know about, you know, that was my DNA, was, uh, I was an HCI database researcher before I got into hypermedia was um, that you know you, you planned things, you designed things, you specified them and you designed them and you tested them and you had this iterative loop and people wrote endless books about how to do that. Just you couldn't do that way. The only way you can make this, this type of world work is by building it and then seeing what you need to use it. And this, is, this has been the story all the way along that it's been possible. And the, the reason I'm gonna go into this is because these things only work when we people put content onto it, when we do things with it. And it's really difficult to predict what type of content we're gonna put on and what we're gonna do with the systems that emerge, uh, because it's very difficult to predict what individuals will do. Um, and so you've got this whole mix of um, psychology, and behavior, human behavior, social science, uh, e economics, law. When you look at something like this, you, you cannot but look at it from different types of perspectives. This one is the technological driver that says sometimes things were, had the right idea, were ahead of the game. Wikipedia could have been like that, but Jimmy Wales probably launched at just the right time when um, Google was already out there. Um, you could write to the web, blog to the wikis we were And of course everyone told, him, told them, include, I mean I can remember saying, thinking, this is, this is never going to work. People are just not going to write all those words. And we did, and we are. And it's, as Wikipedia is evolving, it's not, it's not as they envisaged in 2000 and, uh, 2000, or whenever, 2001, whenever they set it up. Um, it's evolving, and that story, and the, and, and the Facebooks and the social networks, once you've got the writing, you can write, the social web starts to emerge. And we're all into studying that at the moment, and 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 you've got you've got both. Uh, well, you've got the three, as I said before, you've got governments that do the regulation, and you you know you look at what happens in China, where they encourage everyone to go onto the internet, but they 
very much control what you can look at and, and don't give access to our Twitter, but they do microblog a lot, the Chinese. Very subversive in some ways, too. Um, and then, um, where was I going with that one? I can't remember, I lost my thread thinking about Chinese cartoons. That's how they do the subversive stuff with pictures. But um, uh, uh, we, we, this is a phenomenon that we're now, you know, so much work on social media analytics. Um, but it's all, it's a, there's a lot of very retrospective, you know, it's here, so we're going to study it. Um, and it's, it's very hard for anybody to look forward and say, what's going to come next? Because you've got the drivers of government regulation, market forces, because these companies all have shareholders now. The original web doesn't, of course. Um, and there are the co uh, collective intelligence sort of crowdsourced uh, Wikipedias and the like that are completely open and evolve have a very um, um, open model of uh, government. You've got the companies driven by market forces, you've got um, a lot of stuff driven by government regulations, and then you've got what we want to do with it. That's just a very, very complicated mix. And we're now, of course, into a world of doing this all as we move around. And the billions of people yet to get onto the internet will meet the internet first through the mobile phone. Right, they will not see it through these laptops and these that we first met it from. They will see it. So when you go, when, when they talk about the internet in rural India and rural China or in Africa, it's all about actually exchanging pictures on phones because a lot of people can't read and write. Um, so they're, they're, they're seeing it in a whole different way, and the networks they will evolve will be quite different to the ones we've gone. That's a whole you know, ongoing story. Um, and it's very interesting, I think, to... Uh, I haven't... To me, there's this sense of... I don't want to over-dramatise it, but there's a sense of danger to me, in terms of where this is, go is going. Is it all going to close down so it stops being this open and free system we're used to? At the meantime, we've got billions of people to come onto the internet that need it to be open and free so they can get onto it. And it's really, it's really, really, ah, we'll come back to that. I could talk about this forever. Sorry, I'll come back to that. So just a little aside, my story, um, I uh, have worked with Tim I've been friends with Tim ever since uh, we met at that first Hypertech conference, but work with him more often, you know, more sometimes than others. And in particular, around uh, uh, the middle of the last decade, so around 2004, 2005, Tim was very anxious that um, the semantic web, the, the web of linked data, was not taking off. But I tell this as a, this is how web science started because. It was in New York, actually. It was the web conference it was in New York in 2004. And um, that was Nigel, my colleague Nigel Chappell. He's, he's a philosopher and psychologist and an AI professor. And it was, it, I think it was the only second web conference. And we met, we were talking to Tim in the, um, well, the, the hotel where the conference was uh, about why, this, why people weren't, did, weren't linking data, why they weren't putting data out linking it. And in his TED talk, he Tim used to say, you know, I've, you've given me your documents, now give me your data. That's what he said in his TED talk around that time. Um, and, and it was like, so in order to try and understand that, we did two things. One, we looked back over this graph, right? So we started to draw these pictures about how the web had evolved. And also we, start, we said, well, we, we, we've really got to simplify the semantic web and get it back from the AI researchers um, who were worrying about the upside down A's and back with E's and proving that whether or one ontology equals another and build it, right? This is, we have to build this thing very soon. So this paper we published in Intelligent Systems in 2006 was just saying, let's just boil it down to its basic principles, get the data out of it, give everything an identifier, use the existing protocols, don't worry too endlessly about an ontology, just describe the data in some way, give it some metadata. RDF was the, what the World Wide Web Consortium was proposing, but it could be whatever your language you wanted, really. Describe it and link it. Right. And um, so actually, 10 years on from that, 
that is happening. The semantic web now more more called the web of big data or knowledge graph if you're in Google or people are doing the link semantically. Um, and in fact my hypermedia system microcosm was all about semantic linking. I didn't realise it at the time, but that's what we were doing. It was like twenty years ahead of its time. But anyway. Um, and so we were doing two things. We were we were looking at how the web had evolved and trying to work out how to simplify the uh, semantic web story for people. And as part of that discussion, how did that get there? That's completely wrong place. Okay. <laughs> I must have uh, just copied that across. Um, uh, so anyway, we we uh, we are now in this world, uh, as I said, ten years on from that paper, where everything's about data, and you can't move for talking about big data. And you think, oh, yeah, okay, hype. It will it will not fulfill its potential and it will do what all the things do and there's a lot you know, there's a huge amount going on here we've got lots of data this is leading to um, new ways of doing research new ways to run companies new ways to run run countries um, and um, uh, part of what Tim um, and, and Nigel did was uh, uh, lead on the open data movement with people like Jim Hender and Beth Novak in the States here and others to say, let's get the, do the easy stuff first. Let's get the stuff that's that's not private, not secure in any way. Let's get open. There's data that can be made open out as much as possible and link it. And now the whole world is about big data. And how, but it is changing the world. But it, it's very overhyped at the moment. And um, but we do need people who can not just do the um, technical. Um, analysis of the data, but we need people who can interpret that data, and that's what often gets forgotten. <coughs> so, let's say, say this was all part of Tim's original vision, that machines will, um, he, he writes in his book, Weaving the Web, which I'm going to quote again later, that he wrote in the 90s, he said, uh, you know, we're going to get new knowledge from this. If, we, if we've got the data, machines can process the data, and if we semantically link the data, in a way that machines can make inferences from those links, then we will get knowledge. We will be able to infer knowledge we didn't have before. And we're seeing that happen um, uh, all around us. So that was uh, where we were going with the data. And as part of all this, in our looking back at how the web had evolved, and by the web, as I said before, I don't just mean the protocols, HTML, HTTP. I mean the connectivity. And this, we, we, we decided, we, we had this sort of um, uh, seminal moment over a beer somewhere, I can't remember which side of the Atlantic it was, it was definitely in a pub, and, uh, or a bar, uh, about, you know, we really need to be talking about this from an interdisciplinary point of view. And I've always done interdisciplinary research, so this was something I was very happy to push on. And it, but someone like Tim um, and... Um, Actually, I need. I've got to work with social scientists. I've got to work with lawyers and economists in order to understand this this evolution, because this is not just a technical system that we can design and people will use it. It is a socio-technical system, and the and the social scientists talk about the co. It's co-constituted. We co-create the machines and people co-create a whole new ecosystem. Um, so you have these little micro. You start with the micro. I mean, if you remember how Google started, uh, they designed the algorithm. And it was very. They had they had some doc, they had data out. They had documents out there that they could index, but nobody using it. And of course, Google is refined. The more we use it, the more it gets refined. And so you have to go through that building, and then you get to the macro, and then you see what it can be. And then of course, it starts getting abused as much as used. Things go wrong, and you have to reverse re-engineer or reverse engineer. Um, and uh, so it's, it was trying to understand this and we, um, we could have called it all sorts of things. I mean, I, somebody said to me today, oh, there's a new movement. Somebody said to me this last week, there's a new movement in the US called Internet Studies. And I thought, yeah, well, that, that's websites. You know, it's like, is it web? Is it internet? And it's not, as I say, it's not just about learning how to write web pages, you know, do the technical side of it. It's about the connectivity. Um, but we couldn't call it connection science or complexity because those terms already existed and didn't describe what we wanted to do. 
Tim wants to call it philosophical engineering because he studied physics at Oxford when it was called natural philosophy. And this was all about engineering for people. And, and the whole focus of what we wanted to do was try to work out the fundamental principles around, if there aren't any, any about how this ecosystem evolves in order to keep it as a force for good, uh, for the good of humanity, was the sort of high level thought. And um, the other thing we wanted to call it was uh, psychohistory. If you've read your Asimov, Foundations and Empire, that's what Harry Seldon was. He was a psychohistorian. And this was about, this is about the idea that you can't predict what an individual will do, but you can potentially forecast what Ma what society will do, what a, a mass of people will do, and this is the basis for the Foundation and Empire Trilogy. Uh, but we thought people wouldn't understand that. But if you've read the Asimov Trilogy, you do understand it. And, and so we ended up calling it web science, and there's two things I hate about that word. One is web and the other is science. <laughs> <laughs> because web, most people mean, think we mean the technical protocol stuff, and science makes people think even the social scientists who have science in their name, for heaven's sake, sorry if there are any of you around here, think that what we're doing is geeky science. Right? So it's not, it's, it's, it's very interdisciplinary. So we launched this in 2006, that's um, at, at MIT, Tim, myself, Danny Weitzner, who's a, a lawyer by background, and Nigel. Uh, Rob Brooks there was the head of C-Cell lab at the time, the roboticist. And we didn't know whether people would like the idea or not. And as I said, there are lots of other, we could have called it internet studies, we could have called it, well, I wouldn't want to call it social media analytics, but in a way, a lot of what we do now is that. There's lots of different things we could have called And I don't really mind what people call it, as long as they take an interdisciplinary approach to the study of this as a system. And, and, and that's... And uh, that's what I'm interested in. Even in this world where every day you read, you know, the web, the web is dead, right? It's gone because it's all about mobile apps and it's all about Facebook. And actually, the connectivity is still huge, and that's what we're really talking about here. Anyway, um, and so this was a, um, a diagram Nigel drew at, right back at the beginning. Um, Library, uh, library and information systems should be on here, education should be on here. He stopped drawing circles after a while and uh, published this picture. So, But um, it's basically what it means is that all, there's lots of different subjects that, in, um, that ha you can look at the, what we're trying to do from the, all these different perspectives and the way they interact with each other. Um, and it, it's not, you don't have to be an expert in everything, but it's more than just the union of the, uh, the, the, sorry, the intersection uh, at the middle of all this. It's about how, I mean, for example, I, I said, I've just, I've got a student at the moment who's taking a, a political science look at the way the internet has evolved in different cultures. Um, that's political science meets computer science. He's got two supervisors, me and a guy from politics. And we've got huge, lots of examples all around the world now of this type of um, different cultures coming together. Um, so, oh, we, we've developed this initial idea, which was a, um, an in initiative between Southampton and MIT into a, um, a not-for-profit trust, and uh, we have um, conferences, the next ones in Hanover, and everyone's summer schools, all sorts of things. And that's been involved in several of these. We now have a web science track at the World Wide Web Conference. I really didn't want to make the World Wide Web Conference the uh, hub of web science to start with, because the World Wide Web Conference is very techy. I don't like going to it really. It's far too techy for me. And um, it's very expensive to attend. And I wanted to make sure that we got, we had our first conference in, it's not up there actually, in um, Greece, uh, funded by when Greeks, Greece had some money. Um, and it was funded by a, 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 an arts foundation. And it was very, very interdisciplinary and cost almost nothing to attend. And that's how we try and keep it. Uh, anyway, to get on with the story, the, the, one of the things I want to talk to you about, really the most important thing I want to talk to you about today, is how we're trying to link groups around the world together in doing this type of study. So I didn't, we didn't want this to become a professional society. You know, I've been president of the ACM. I wasn't trying to build a new ACM. I've been president of the British Community Society. 
If I'm a serial president of these sorts of things, if ever I join anything, I end up organising it usually. And I didn't want to, you know, we, to, to create another, um, because it was so interdisciplinary. It's like, how do you create a society of something that's so interdisciplinary? So this is an, an old map now. It is we're about to st start a new one because we have re we have relaunched this and it's grown a little bit. Um, but I didn't have time to uh, to um, do it. So basically, all of these are still members. But what we did was we we started this in 2009 and we got key labs from around the world who were wanted to be part of this journey and and were doing work in this area to collaborate in order to do student exchanges, um, to run conferences in the region and globally, global conferences, international conferences, um, and to share particularly research results and data. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, then this was out, so that up until quite recently, these are the 15 labs. Derry doesn't really exist anymore, but I think all the others are still there, although we're not sure about Rio because the leadership team there have gone. Uh, but all the others are still firmly part of this, and we're bringing in new labs or observatories. I've talked to you about observatories in a minute all the time. Um, there's a growing um, two labs coming on board in Bangalore and Chennai in um, India. We've got um, an observ a data observatory in Adelaide now, I'll tell you a bit about that in a minute. Um, growing networks in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, it's always interesting. We really need, we have a lab in China. Um, we have a lab in Korea already. Um, Singapore's a very important hub for us. We run a winter school out there every year. Um, and it's really, I'm, you know, I. It's really interesting to see though how, how the internet is driven in those cultures. And of course, Russia is another one where you want to think about how this is working. I've been out to Qatar recently, I'm going to set one up in Qatar, which is one of the more uh, easier Middle Eastern states to work with. Although I had an invite to go to Iran, and then I saw something on CNN this morning about Americans being kidnapped, and I thought, mm, do I really want to go there? I'm not sure, and I also have an invite to go to Saudi. Um, you know, but it's really important because these people are using the internet. Um, the other place that we haven't really um, penetrated is darkest Africa. I haven't got a lab in Cape Town yet, and I say I, oh, that's just that we. Um, but but um, I really want to get labs in areas that where this this cult, this in, this technology is new. And growing, and we'll have a, a new. Um, we'll see new things happen. So, um, and and there's more labs coming on in the in the US and in Europe. Uh, but this is never meant to be big. This is not, as I say, it's not a membership. This is about linking together people who are doing core work in this area and who want to collaborate. Uh, so anyway, I'll come back to that. Um, one thing I want to say before I go into the, the world of the, of the observatory, because this is, is, I think, really important. We have uh, recast, in some ways, over the last 10 years, thinking about what we're doing in terms of something that Tim, the word Tim used in his book he wrote in 1999 uh, called We in the Web. And he used this term social machine in the book, and, and this is a meme that's picked up quite a lot in the last, particularly with all the social media analytics work that's going on around the world. He says, um, he was talking about what changes the web uh, was going to make with the society, but the big thing about our view of this is that we changed it. It is a co-created uh, ecosystem. And he says, um, Real life must be full of all kinds of social constraints, the very processes from which society arises. And that means, you know, we've learned to live as a society over many millennia so that we generally don't beat each other up for food. And, uh, you know, we know how to sit in a room like this and behave ourselves uh, without upsetting our neighbours. And um, we've learned to, to coexist, to, be, to live in a civilised society. Obviously, there are people that don't quite get that these days, and you see all the horrors happening in the world, but um, that's human nature, unfortunately. 
Um, and we have, we all have, you know, we try and work around them with that and help the people who are, who are caught up in it. But Tim then talked about, well, if we move into this whole idea of this digital planet where um, we've got computers managing the processes and we are doing the creativity, then we have to learn how to socially exist in that space. You know, what is it? And, and this is the big um, uh, controversy all the time: is what are the social science? What you know, the fact that you can say, well, if you have a digital ecosystem, people are going to want to take your money away from you. There will always be people. Is that a given? That people are going to want to defraud you of money and steal from you, right? So we should have predicted that nothing like more. I mean, Tim will often say things like, well, if I'd known what people were going to do with the thing I invented, I would have put more security protocols in at the beginning. Um, but uh, th there's more subtle things as well, um, the bullying and things like that, that, and all sorts of stuff that goes on in the social networks. And you think, well, was that bound to happen? Because that's, that's what happens in, real, in, re in the real world, in the physical world, that was bound to be reflected. Are there new things happening? Um, what are the, how are the behaviors changing? So it's studying what he called the social machine. And we get criticized for calling it a machine because that machine implies created by machines. But the whole thing is this issue of you've got a system of, mach of technical mach machines, computers, and a system of people, a network of people, uh, us, and they come together not knowing anything about each other and create artifacts that didn't exist before. And all of the things that we know about, I would argue, are on the web, um, on the internet, whatever you want to call it, are so examples of what Tim described as a social machine. So the web itself, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Wikipedias, the simple things like TripAdvice and the Zooniverse, um, crowdsource, uh, citizen science stuff, the Ushahidi um, system for crowdsourcing after disasters, the, the Amazons, the Ebays, the YouTube, they evolve into all sorts of things. and and commercial companies and they buy, you know, um, uh, Google bought YouTube and Facebook bought whatever it bought and the only things it's bought and, and um, so they, they gobble and they become, these, these big social machines become uh, giant attractors in the network, mathematical network sense. They, once they become dominant, it's very, very hard to set up a competition to them because they attract everything to them like big black holes or centers of gravity um, and they they evolve and they and and partly that's driven by market forces and partly it's driven by what we do with them but and you don't want to be in a social network where your friends aren't and of course the kids go off like so i always use the example of the kids leaving twitter to go or facebook to go to instagram or whatever the big things are at the moment um, because they don't want to be where their parents are, and they, uh, but it's the same meme, and actually, of course, the big guys are buying the small guys, but you have, so you have, you have things going off at tangents, so it's all very interesting how this happening. But anyway, we talk about the social machines, and, um, and, a, and this is where we come to the data piece, because what we're arguing is that without people, then you've got you know, computers getting more powerful, cheaper, faster processing, we produce data and we're analysing that data and that's happening in finance markets and governments are doing it. And, but you add people in and you've got this social networking element that has emerged and you put those two things together and this is the social media, social media analytics. And this is very much, we have re, you know, thought about it as, um, in a way, the theory and practice of web science is in a way the theory and practice of social machines. Um, at that, we have a big program grant, a big grant at Southampton to do this type of work. But I now think about the work I do as a computer scientist as the theory and practice of Turing machines. And uh, this whole new world is the theory and practice of social machines. There is, of course, an argument that says, well, when the as the machines get bigger and better and more intelligent, they will do the creativity as well, and then we're all in trouble. And this is Stephen Hawking's argument, but that's a, that's a philosophical argument at the moment. Um, I need to move on and finish on the observatory so and data. So um, in order to think about how to study social machines, um, the, you can't, snapshots don't work. You have to do it on a global scale. 
Um, and you have to be constantly, you've got data coming out all the time. You've got to be analyzing and looking at what's happening. And so I was struck by the comparisons with the way the physicists um, analyze, the, the, get the data from um, what's happening out in the heavens, and, um, uh, and, and the astronomers are, they get that data down using their amazing telescopes, and then they, they learn over time and have ways of sharing that data. So they appear as a global force in order to help us explain the big theories of where we came from and where we might be going to um, in terms of uh, on a planetary scale. And that's, uh, and that's why I started talking about the Webb Observatory in order to try and think about how we would do this for uh, data from, from how people are using the web, what people do on the web. Um, and another analogy was um, the way the climate scientists um, very controversially do things. Now, the, the weather forecasters have got better and better weather forecasting, and they've done it 200 years ago weather forecasting didn't exist. Right? People thought God held the clouds up. And, and you know, it, it took some pioneers and a lot of people who were told that what they were doing was rubbish in order to start collecting data. And it all happened here in the States around collecting, well, we did stuff in Europe as well, but particularly about collecting data about storm in order to track a storm and see uh, where it came from and where it went to prove that you could do some forecasting if you had the data. And they started collecting the data, they've been collecting it for um, decades or centuries now. And that data together with current data and the system we have in place around the world to what's happening with the weather um, and the models, the sophisticated computer modeling we can do these days enables us to have a pretty good idea that we're going to have record breaking temperatures on Friday here, right? Um, so it doesn't come as a surprise a few days out. That's quite new, it's a modern phenomenon, and we're try they're trying to decide, the climate scientists, whether we are having we are having an impact, we society are having an impact on that. Um, that's the big controversy, of course. But if we're trying to do that for the digital planet, you're trying to observe what people are doing. So you've got all the issues of private data, secure data that needs to be secure. Um, even looking at things, you potentially change people's behaviour. So there's a whole, but we use the term observatory, and that now seems to be, there's, you see people talking about observatories all the time in this space. They're talking about data observatories, and we, we are particularly talking about the web observatory in that we are looking at how to do this type of research that I've been talking about. Um, and and so some, some of the data will be can be open, a lot of it will be very closed. We need them. Um, uh, access controls on anything we build, but we also need to be able to share the ways, the tools by which we analyse the data, because the amount of effort that research, researchers go into to, create, to build tools to analyse the data they harvest or they buy from a source about social media, um, to do the social media analytics, you know, we need to be able to share those as well. Not everybody be reinventing wheels. And we need to be able to do what good scientists do, which is replicate experiments. Try experiment, the same experiment in a different culture. Keep data, being co collect data over a period of time, uh, forever really, so we can do longitudinal work. Uh, so that we can, and particularly I'll talk about this in a minute, look back at what's happened in order to try and infer what might happen in the future in the same or similar circumstances. So to support longitudinal research. So this is our little digital telescopes or microscopes, whatever they are, looking at this huge ecosystem. And this only works if we join everything up. So that's, uh, well, there's the levels of sharing, as I said. Um, I'm going to speed up in order. Open, so the open data sets are the easy pickings. Um, then there'll be shareable data sets. You can email me or Matt or Nosh or whoever's got data sets that they can't just give you, but you could share it under certain terms and conditions. And then there's stuff you've got to be really careful about because you've given away um, very private data, and like uh, accidentally, or data to do with businesses or government secure, you know, the secure data that intelligence agencies have. Um, and we need to find ways, and there are people around the world trying to work out ways to do this type of research without compromising privacy and security. Um, 
uh, and we need to share the tools that we've developed. And the idea is then that everybody basically is responsible for managing the data that they've collected, or harvested, produced, whatever, uh, store those data sets, make that information about what data they've got available to everybody else, share the tools, or at least say what tools they've used to do the analysis, and allow access to people who are not computer scientists. So much of this is often protected by a barrier of geeky programmers, and we've got to enable people to look at this um, and do input and interpretations who are not going to, can't, and don't want to write code. So there's uh, so much to do here. Um, so we're sort of building, and, and when there's no, when you're trying to do something like this, and you say, I'm building this huge global web go observatory, and people go, well, what have you got? And we say, well, not very much at the moment. Um, they go, well, why should I bother? And that's what they said about the early days of the web, is what they said about it. Because you know, if there's nothing there, you can't do anything significant with it. So we're actually sort of building a social machine to observe social machines. And what I, all I know is, whatever we get going, this year, next year, the year after, will, in 10 years' time, will be completely different to what we thought it was going to be, or nothing at all. But anyway. Um, and it's all cycle history, really. So uh, I'll, I have not online, so I'm not going to show you the demo, but um, you can look it up. Um, basically, any observatory, in, and the, uh, Jim Hen has built uh, a, a version at RPI. We've got a version at Southampton, which we're giving the code away for um, as open source. Um, and there are uh, various various types of data observatories and, uh, emerging. Don't really care what you use, to be honest. Just tell people what data you've got. It doesn't mean make it available. It just says, I've got this data set, and this is the work I've done with it, and this is how I did it. Um, uh, if you look in, if you look at WebObservatory.org.uk, you, you click on um, data sets, you get the list. Um, and we're not very good at cataloging this. It's just a list of data sets at the moment. We're developing search tools, but it all takes time. And you can see the visualizations that the people that have to have done. Um, and these are the, some of the visual like, This is one we did with them um, uh, in we, when it, I took some students to China to Xinhua, and they were analysing some Weibo data sets, which is um, their social networking, one of their social networking. I don't think they use it very much anymore, but anyway, it was at the time their social networking one. And this was at the time of the Fukushima um, nuclear reactor uh, meltdown, and the Chinese are worried about the um, radiation hitting their shore. And there was a they, there's a myth um, that salt protects from radiation. I remember when we used to put salt over the left shoulder because it. My mother, my grandmother taught me to throw spilt salt over my left shoulder because that would fly in the face of the devil. You know these things. <laughs> you don't do that so much these days. But um, there's there was the myth in China that salt will protect you from radiation sickness. So there was a run on salt, and um, <laughs> and that and. Uh, so, and, and they basically, they got the, the, now this is the interesting thing, because we don't speak any Chinese, and so, anyway, it, the, um, you don't really know what is, is happening, but the analysis they did from the Weibo sets, so they were looking at it from the point of view of when did the humour go from black humour to white humour, um, and that's, that was the particular project these students chose, and that data, um, so someone else could come along and say, well, I would like to take this approach to another set of data, you know, a, a potentially traumatic, traumatic event that we study when it goes from stopping being traumatic to being solved, and look at how humour was used to tell stories about what's going on. You could potentially repeat an experiment like that. Uh, we look at different types of social media and when people start talking about... Um, Conversations and I was talking about events. When where is it? Is it Twitter or Wikipedia or Google? We this first hit um, and the time lags and so on. And, and talking to Matt earlier about elections, this is really important in terms of um, people looking up information about election candidates and what the conversations are and where it's happening. Um, so the idea is to link all these up, and I really want Rutgers to be in this map. This is a very small map at the moment. There's loads of them now. Um, just to show that the idea is that we all share, basically. And all we're asking, so we've just brought on, that's uh, the one in Bangalore we set up, and uh, that's uh, South Australia. I'm not showing them all here. We have an internet science fund as well that's funded by the European Commission. But um, this is about telling people, 
at this stage, just describing the metadata, just, well, metadata about metadata. So what data sets you've got. We're not, we're not asking people to hand the data out for free. That would not be possible. And it's too complicated technically and uh, all sorts of other reasons as well. Um, and what we use at the moment, um, this has been driven by Jim, and this may change as different uh, um, protocols emerge, but we're using schema.org at the moment, which is sort of a simplified linked data uh, language to just, um, so the, the, um, that's described, because this came out of the of Microsoft and Google and IBM and that as a, as a language to um, describe data. And, uh, and so we've set up a very simple web observatory schema, which literally just says, this is about the project, these are the data sets I've got, this is what's in the data, and these are the tools I've used to analyze it at a meta level. And that, just in itself, imagine if everybody doing this type of work around the world made that information available. You could, we will develop search engines that will say, who's got data on earthquakes? Who's got data on elections? Who's got data on um, immigration? Who's got data on Ebola? Right. Who's, who's been gathering data from Twitter or on this topic? Right. And because it's happening all over the world. You do work here on this, I'm sure, I know. Right. And people around the world, and, it's, and, and I liken it a bit to when we started, um, and I say we, because Southampton was very involved in this, but the whole business of open access publishing. And when we moved, a lot of you are too young to remember this, but there were several of us here who do remember when you only had printed copies of journals and you had to go to a library to get them or get them in the post. And we moved to this idea that we would publish on the web. And at, this was in about 1994, and everybody told us we were mad. The publishers in particular told us we were mad because they didn't want to lose their income. But they just told us we were mad to even think about it. And we got so much resistance from university authorities, from the people who do the metrics about league tables, from the publishers, from the... But of course, the natural way to share information was on this ecosystem we've created. And now, if you want to get somebody's paper, there are so many different ways. We still don't have a global way of finding them, but Google's good enough. It sort of does. You know, it, You've got the repositories. I mean, I don't know if you have an institutional repository here. You probably do. I bet you use DSpace and not ePrint. We can use ePrint. But anyway, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. There's not many people. So Hamster still does the open source for ePrints. Um, I will tell you the story because I'm proud of it. My, I had a student, a PhD student called Rob Tansy, who wrote the first person, version of ePrints when he was just finished his PhD at Southampton, directed by Stephen Hart. Heard of. And when we got the first version of ePrints up, we had our institutional repository and everyone was telling us we were mad. Rob was poached, well, he was given a job by Hewlett Packard to write the first version of DSpace. So my PhD student went from Southampton to like, when he wrote the first version of DSpace at MIT. And then he was poached by Google to do the early work for Google Scholar. So I'm very proud of Rob. I don't know what's happened to him now. I lost touch with him. But anyway, um, and I'm sort of, and that's it's the same sort of analogy that it's actually all about sharing in order to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. Right. So we have access to the research that we we are all doing. The big gap in all this, of course, is that so much of the data we need is in the Facebook and Google and Amazon and eBay silos. Um, and there's another whole world about why that's a safety valve at the moment. Um, but, but to start with, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's something about persuading researchers to share um, and then breaking down the barriers about, because if you go as an intern to Google, you get access to their data. So it's all about um, how we can break these barriers down in order to do the sort of research we think is important. But of course, the companies have their own agendas in that. Another issue I recognise there. So uh, once you've um, people, we start at the, at the Web Science Trust site. We are currently putting a catalogue. That's an old slide, but there's a catalogue of all the observatories that exist. And then if you drill down, you can see the data sets that are in there. So my ambition is to have Rutgers as one of that node, a node on that site. And 
There's a simple ambition to map the digital universe, which may be too big an ambition for anybody. But one thing I want to say while I'm in here in Rutgers is that the key thing, there's so much data we need to do this that's in the web archives around the world. It's not all of easily available as data from social media analytics. So much of what we have done on the web and what we are doing on the web is still in web pages that are being archived by the Internet Archive, by the libraries, like the Library of Congress, the British Library, and you can't access it or analyse it because you don't have the data about what's in it, and that has to be harvested from the archives. And that's a huge amount of work. And if we don't share the results of that, then none of us will ever get anywhere. We need everybody who's got web archives to be taking this type of approach um, so that they tell people what's... Because it's only when you've got the data from the archives that you can begin to start analysing the what what happened around you know uh, the uh, presidential... I'd love us to have a big... And this is what I want to do for the workshop next year. Focus on what's happening with the presidential election next year. Right? What's being said on the web pages? What's on the social media analytics? What are the candidates saying? What are what the parties saying? Um, because if if everybody who's interested in that actually join forces to do a, a real global project, because this is a although we don't get a vote, it's a really important election for the rest of the world as well. Um, you know, it, the eyes of the world will be on the US next year in this term, in these terms. And so I'm, I really want to get this, this going, and I'd like to mark this through. So I'm basically finished. Um, why is this important? Because I think we are at a turning point for the web. I think it has got so big and so important that it's attracted all this, um, so many, you know, all the big players um, in every part of society to look at the issues of net neutrality, internet governance, cyber security, privacy, trust. Tim's big thing is re-decentralization, get, get the web back from, uh, from the silos. And to me, the whole, um, I've always talked about the web going behind the scenes, the connectivity is becoming much more implicit rather than explicit. It used to be all about links, and now it's about those in, implicit links rather than explicit. Who has the right to do what with our data? Uh, very big since the post Snowden, and that's now such a big issue, and we need a human rights charter. Um, and we, I believe firmly that we can't answer these questions unless we have the intelligence, or at least we have the data to point to, to, to say what happened when. Um, one last thought I'll leave is we, we've got the Internet of Things appearing like the Monty Python foot, I think, of. Um, so this is the social machines, and now we've got our sort of cosy social machines that we sort of know a little bit about, and now we've got the, we are going to have the Internet of Things descending on this, which is going to have to give us food for thought. Uh, the web community is looking at the web of things, I'm just going to, and my worry is that we're creating an environment for the growth of anti-social machines, and you can pass that either as anti-social machines or anti-social machines. Um, but that's a, another whole, uh, just something I'm playing with at the moment. Um, and Manuel Castells, who's a great friend of mine and Matt's, um, talks about you know the fact that um, so many people, governments and big companies know so much about us that there's huge implications for the future in terms of digital surveillance. And we have, you know, whatever we do, this is this is a, this is something we've got to really. Um, concern ourselves with for the future. And so I, this is a quote given to me by, um, oh yeah, Big Brother or Brave New World, where are we going? Um, Huxley or um, Big Brother? Orwell? Or Orwell or Huxley, yeah, sorry. And my mind just went there. <laughs> um, but I just, I like finishing with this one now. This I haven't seen the film yet. Have you seen The Martian yet? Yeah. Is it any good? It's, yeah, it's good. The book is really good. Yeah, I couldn't get to it. Anyway, the point is, he says at one point, um, I've got to science the shit out of this. And JP Rangaswamy, a great guru on the web, says, actually, all the, he, he turned this around and he said, there's a huge amount of data out there in order to understand what, how we're going to keep um, these systems alive and kicking despite all the pressures and all the problems that we um, can see. And, um, uh, we're going to have to web science the shit out of it. <laughs> Sorry, I've talked far too long. Well. That's it. So, thank you. Question.
we have about 10 minutes for questions. Open it up to discussion. I meant to finish before 12, sorry. There's too many things that I always want to say. But I survived without a coffee fit. Right. <laughs> questions? Yeah, right. So thanks uh, very much. I, I really, I'd like to speak, uh, how you started out in, in particular that nice slide with the, uh, the uh, with the stages, right? Read only, read write, social. Okay, this obviously, you know, leads to a question mark, right? Of what comes next? And you know, at first I put down, you know, after a while listening to you, link data, but that doesn't no. sound right. Uh, what do you th uh, what are your speculations about uh, what comes next? Well, you see, where because linked data is, is, is a technology, right? So the, the link link data is is running through that um, as a as a as a, one of the it started to emerge in the two thousand the launches, whatever you call them, and it's now quite it's getting quite big now. So we have and this is the whole big data thing. We are there. We have link we have data. We have link data, but um, to me. The, uh, the problem I think we've got is, are we losing any sort of control in this space? Mm. Um, and uh, it's this, um, so uh, I'm inspired by the work my student's doing at the moment, where he's looking at China, which is a very authorita authoritarian regime in terms of this space, he encourages everybody to be on the internet, uh, but totally controls what they can look at. Now we, there are all sorts of interesting things around that, and this is the sort of, we've got the um, Orwell, but the Big Brother versus Brave New World, because you could argue that this is what Big Brother wants, because of course, giving everyone access to the internet means they know all about us, right? Our governments do too. So they, although they don't try and control as much what we look at, they certainly, know what we look at or could know what we look at if they looked at the right in the right places i mean the, 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 po the possibility is there so they've got all the data um and then in, in our so we look at china we think oh we're not like that but in our world we've got the facebook so facebook is hugely dominant and is trying very hard to to suck everything i'm not saying this is not an anti-facebook rant it's just this is the market force facebook's wants everybody to be in their space. They don't want a web. They want a Facebook. Now the difference between Facebook and the web is Facebook has, is, has shareholders and it's, it's driven by market forces. The web is of the people. It's not owned by anybody. It's run by a tiny team of, well not run, the protocols are developed by a tiny group of people who are funded on a shoestring um, and the internet similarly. Um, and so that to me, the tension going forward is that world versus the sort of closed authoritarian in China, but just market driven closed world. Um, it's, it's really all about open versus closed. And um, so uh, I don't know where it's going because the, the, the other thing is that um, this business about the links are, people are moving away from, and I, this is another problem, because links were hugely important to, you know, the explicit e the URLs, the blue on the page, really important in the early web. And Google was totally dependent on those to, from, from running the algorithm. And that's sort of disappearing. The connectivity is coming implicitly. So you're getting streams of stuff, and you're getting information coming to you, implicitly linked because pe the system knows what you want to see, or it thinks it knows what you want to see. So you're getting streamed information more. We've seen this in the music industry. Um, so I think, if I had to say, I would say where we're going next is streaming and implicit linking, but my worry is who is programming the machines? Does that make any sort of sense at all? I, I don't know really. If I knew, I'd probably make a lot of money. It seems like a big issue is how do we govern algorithms? <coughs> how do you participate in the design and consequences of the algorithms that turn around and apply who we are? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. I don't know that the, I mean, there are going to be technical things that are important next, but 
maybe the next big thing is really governance in this space. And well, I mean, it obviously already is a big thing. Yeah, but, but it's, it's we um, haven't figured out how to do it. <laughs> and it's but it's also um, what are the companies allowed to do in this space, isn't it? Because they can actually sort of do anything. I mean, they can target us. They can. They've got enough data. And we work for them for free. Exactly. Yeah, continuously. Exactly. With no stake, we get no stake in it except maybe a couple of tidbits to us that way. <laughs> we just feel good. But we, but we all pay the price because we. <laughs> but we, we, the social compact seems to be we accept that because of the value we get. I mean, I can't imagine life without a Google or a Wikipedia or a, I like blogging. I mean, I don't know what your favourite social network. Is. I'm sorry, I like Twitter. I would just, just to push on that though, I'd say that that's the governance issue is who's defined those terms. Uh, Google's exactly. been much more powerful in defining those terms and, and, and so what choice do we have? Well exactly. Yeah. So I mean, exactly. So yeah, I did things I like, but kind of, I don't even get to realize what I might like more. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, so you had a slide towards the end, a big footprint of IoT. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more oh, about sorry, it. Oh, you had many more slides. Oh, no, no, I've stopped that. No, I didn't. So to, uh, to me, it's a yeah, lot more machine, a lot more people, but also a lot more types of data. So it's not See, just... See, I think, I, I think that so why I put this on, and I thank you for asking, because I was rushing at the end because I had talked to too long anyway. This to me is that we sort of have a beginning understanding of how this, these social machines are built. And we, we have this social contact with the company. Right, they provide the technology, we input the content, and it's that social compact that makes the thing grow. Now we've got this, I call it the Monty Python foot of the internet of things, because it's like coming, it's descending on us, it's, it's there, um, and, and you can all see the potential for it, everything in the world, it was all part of Tim's original vision anyway, but this is, this is coming from the companies that are producing things with sensors in um, and potentially you know we'll they will all talk and do things without us being involved right and this is targeting us um, who writes those algorithms rather than Orwell and Huxley, you might think of uh, the Terminator versus the Matrix. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a very good analogy. I'm going to use that in my next talk. That's a perfect analogy because, um, and, and, it, and it's, um, it's where's that knowledge of all, you know, who is controlling the knowledge of what's linked to what. At the moment, the saving grace is that the Internet of Things is not an Internet. Um, in the sense, because at the moment, there are no agreed interoperable standards. So you buy a Samsung thing, or you buy Apple, or you buy Google, they don't all talk to each other. They will, that will emerge one way or another, whether it's from a sort of IETF type. In fact, Vint Cerf is talking in New York today about all this and all the problems we've got to solve if this happens, you know. But um, so at the moment, we're sort of protected because they're all in little silos, you, they aren't interconnected. But when they become interconnected, then uh, we potentially do have this terminator versus matrix. And it's um, huge. I mean, you, people always talk about healthcare and how we'll be able to you know, monitor people and tell them when to take their drugs or you know, see when the, my mother's fallen on the floor or whatever. But there's so many huge issues. You know, I can't get, my mum's 95, I can't even get her to wear the thing around her neck. You know, to, she says, oh, it's on my wheelie thing over there. If you fall down. Anyway, that's why the point, there's all the privacy issues and the, um, who's gonna come and pick my mum up off the floor when the bell rings, you know, when the buzzer goes off. That's the sort of. Two things related to this. One is so one is that we're work, looking through some cases comparing this sort of the evolution of the, the logic, right? Of what exactly what you're talking about. And so we've been looking at uh, John Deere, which makes tractors for mm -hmm. farming, and they're they're right now pushing the idea that tractors are kind of like music and computers. So in other words, a farmer can't really work on the tractor anymore. They can't repair the tractor or do anything. So you get locked into a service contract. And of course, because they own 
the algorithm, the computer that runs the tractor, and you're just sort of getting to use that for the price that you pay, but you don't get to do anything except maybe change the tires or yeah. put some grease in. But the flip side concern that we've been noticing there is that's also then who owns the data that comes from the tractor, not just that tractor, but all of the tractors, and how that can be sort of mined and inferred to make predictions about what might happen in the commodity market that John Deere then would be quite privileged to doing. And so a scenario like that, to me, kind of really jumps right into the heart of well, this exactly. whole which thing, like why, about the government. Which is why I put it in this diagram as a huge a disruptor. It's a big disruptor. And the web itself, the internet, the web giving us access to the internet was a major disruptor as big as anything. This one could potentially be big or bigger. Because as my Samsung refrigerator reminds me that I need milk, it also knows all the other refrigerators out there that need milk. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. And if it doesn't like you, it could leave you to start. If you could let my milk go sour. <laughs> yeah, or if it could harangue you until you drink more and more milk and then exactly. you know, you're not staying on your diet. Well, this is uh, this is it, you know, it's like, we could be, this is the whole Stephen Hawking thing, which is, if, because we could walk into this quite blindly, because like it's in the algorithms, and the whole issue of once it all gets connected up, things will happen we have no control over, just as it has with the web, it's just happened. And the companies have sort of had some control over it, but only partially. And this world is actually talking about at control of us at all sorts of levels, more than just the information that you take in. So well, you're saying at one level there's a space in the web of science for discussing these things? Web of science, and, and not web of science, web of science. Sorry, web of yeah. science for absolutely. investigating, yeah. discussing. Absolutely. Because I take web science as broad as that, you see. Mm -hmm. it's, to me, I, want to, I really want to call it connectivity science or link science. Mm -hmm. To me, it's all about connectivity. And, and Wow. With the thought of a refrigerator is controlling Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Wendy one more time.